The brain is an electrical organ and brain cells communicate through electricity. When neighborhoods of brain cells are engaged in a particular function, they communicate together and resonate in these high frequencies. And by understanding what frequencies are occurring in what place during what function, we're beginning to understand the brain's electrical language. And so this is the core of brain-computer interface. Kathy Wolf's a patient with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And she's one of the people who's participating in our group's effort to develop brain-computer interface systems for people who are very disabled. People who are very disabled, and by this I mean people who haven't just lost the use of their arms or legs, but also may not be able to speak, may not be able to breathe, may not even be able to move their eyes very well. They can live for long periods but they can lose their ability to communicate effectively with others, and this is a tremendous loss. The alternative we're trying to develop for people like that is to use brain waves, to use the actual electrical signals produced by the brain in the course of its normal activity as a communication tool. When nerve cells are active and when the connections between them are active, when they're talking to each other, they produce electrical fields that are detectable right next to the neurons, and they're also detectable from the scalp. These are called EEG signals. The basic electrode cap has eight white discs, which are EEG electrodes that touch the scalp. And the system shows the person a uh, matrix of letters and numbers and function calls, and groups of them are flashing very rapidly and the system is looking at her brain waves and looking at the response in the brain waves to those flashes. So when the group flashes that has the letter she wants, her brain says, aha, and the brain waves are different, and we can pick that up. The kind of system that Kathy's using is a very simple brain-computer interface system using EEG recorded from the scalp and it works pretty well. But when you record from the scalp, you have activity from the muscles of the head, from the eyes, from head movements. You have other kinds of noise, basically, non-brain noise that you have to recognize, contend with, filter out, etc. cetera. Um, you don't have that with ECOG. ECOG is our abbreviation for electrocorticography which essentially means listening with a, a, an electrode or a recording device directly on the surface of the brain. The people in whom we implant these devices represent a large number of people with seizures in whom medicines uh, uh, just don't work to prevent seizures. The only way we can understand the discrete location of where their seizures are coming from is by recording at the level of electrocorticography. And so while they're undergoing their other assessments, these patients allow us to essentially listen in in this space for our research. So they treat you okay here? Yeah, I think they treat me very good. Yeah. Well, hopefully, you know, that things are going to go well. And yeah, I hope so. I just want to get... Back to normal. I just want to get good enough work to go work. The way our experiments work is the patient's ECOG grid is connected to a computer system that then records brain signals as the subject performs different types of tasks. Are you ready? I'm ready. Set and begin. Each dot corresponds to one electrode in the brain. As brain activity changes, that dot will grow into a circle. The larger the diameter of the circle, the more the brain signals change at that corresponding location. At the most basic level, we can differentiate different types of growth behaviors just simply by judging where activity changes in the brain. 
For example, moving my hand will produce activity changes in areas called hand motor areas of the brain. Speaking different types of words will produce changes in different areas that are related to language and facial movements. Dunk, stick, shake, Once we have some shell. understanding of what brain areas change when we produce words, it may also be possible to actually even differentiate particular words a person is speaking or perhaps even imagining. What we're going to do now is we're going to show you different words on the screen. And what I want you to do is to imagine repeating uh, each word as it's presented. Okay? Yep. All right. So in our experiments, a person would see a word on the screen and then would simply imagine repeating the word. We would then analyze brain signals and determine what brain signals change in what particular pattern for the different words. What we see here is um, brain activity patterns uh, as different uh, subjects uh, produce different words. In these patterns, the amount of activity is shown in different shades of color. So red means the most activity and gray basically means no activity. What we see is that the patterns of activity that are produced by certain areas in the brain will be different for different words. And this is what we can use to differentiate what words a particular person is imagining. So we can tell the word cap apart from the word cat, for example. In one example, we had 36 different words, and we were able to, with some success, determine what word the person was speaking or, or even imagining. Now, if we can tell from the brain what words a person wants to communicate, that will be a boon for people who are uh, disabled and, and can otherwise not communicate. See. Current devices may only give about five characters a minute at relatively high accuracy. What we're trying to do is to improve the rate and or accuracy of that communication. Once we have a stable device uh, that can be used in, 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 in people for that purpose, I think we'll, we'll be able to do a lot more than we can do now. ECOG is like EEG, except it's a lot closer. It has a lot more resolution. You can see more detail. So it potentially could be um, more powerful than EEG. It's very promising. I'm very excited about it.